Well, I got to tell you, I love worshiping here. We went home last year and said, we were just part of such a wonderful church. You are the most loving, kind, caring, sweetest people. And we're so, we just felt so fulfilled last year. You got the greatest worship team ever. And we'd love to take, we'd love to take them with us. And uh, in fact, we are taking the drummer, so just know that. So, and uh, Wayne, it sounds like I'm at Wembley. So thank you. This is just, uh, the music was incredible. Uh, last year we were here and the message that God had put on my heart uh, that I had, I had railed against God. I did not want that message. I said, no, God, that's not it. But God kept telling me, no, this is the message. It was, we are the Jesus people. And we went home after that message and God began to stir in our heart. And we actually, in November, changed the name of our church to Jesus People Church because we're the Jesus people, amen? And so what I wanna to talk to you about today, my message is breaking free from me. The Bible teaches us that we've got three enemies that are trying to mess up our life. The world comes against you, the devil comes against you, and you come against you. Come on. And we want to talk about the enemies in our lives because if you don't know who the enemy is, you can never win the battle and you're going to go through life defeated most of your life and that's not God's plan for your life. So today, I'm here to talk to you about your biggest enemy. Your biggest enemy is not the devil. It's not the world. It's you. You are your biggest problem. You know how I know that? Because I am my biggest problem. Because I can't ever get away from me. We left America uh, last Monday, and I could have said, you know, I'm running away from all my problems. The problem is, I took me with me. <laughs> Who takes you with you everywhere? Wherever you go, all those internal things are inside of you. And the Bible says we've got two natures if you're a believer. You have your old nature that wants to do what's wrong and what's fun, what's convenient, not necessarily the thing that's best for you. We know for certain there are possibly lots of things that we want to do that aren't good for us. And there are probably uh, the things that mess up our life. We, 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 we do that. There are probably lots of things you do that would be good for us and healthy for us. And you don't do them. And these things mess up our life. And sometimes we do them anyway. Who does it anyway sometimes? And Paul said in Romans 7, he said this, and I'll paraphrase. He said, I, I can't figure myself out. All my best intentions aren't good enough. I want to do the right thing and I don't. And I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I do. And I'll tell you, this encourages me because this sounds like me sometimes. How about you? And that's the story of me and that's the story of you. But it's not just knowing it, it's getting yourself to do it that's the battle because we have this natural resistance inside of us that wants to do what's easy and convenient and quick rather than what's right and what's best. And I know the doctor says I'd be better off if I ate more chicken and vegetables and fruit, but I love fish and chips. Amen? <laughs> I, uh, I gained more weight on the way here from the airport than, than uh, I have in the last year probably. But life is about choices and you have to make them. What's best for me? What's right for me? What does God want for me most of all? So, so best intentions are not good enough. The truth is the battle for you inside you. Let me, let me say it this way. Most of your unhappiness in life is because you listen to you instead of God. When you do that, you tell yourself things all the time that aren't true. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean that it's accurate. A lot of things that we think are not right. Did you know our brain lies to us all the time? So today, God put it on my heart. In fact, I had a totally different message, but God woke me up in the middle of the night. He said, this is the message for Life Church. And so what I want to do today is look at how to overcome the seven weapons of self-destruction. Who'd love to know how to overcome self-destruction? These are, there are things you do to yourself all the time that damage you, hurt you, cause you to self-destruct, that cause you enormous stress, pain, unhappiness, unneeded pressure. And then I'm going to show you from God's word, Romans 8, how the Bible tells us the spirit of God living within you can give you the antidote to every single one of your self-destructive weapons. God's got a victorious answer for every trick of the devil. He's got a victorious answer for every single thing the flesh tries to do to you. So I want to encourage you to write these seven things down. We're going to start with seven weapons of self-destruction, seven things that mess up people's lives more than anything else. No, here we go. Number one, the first weapon of self-destruction is shame. You cannot be joyful and feel ashamed at the same time. 
When you feel ashamed, it robs you of all of your joy. When you feel guilty, when you feel regretful, God doesn't want you walking around feeling ashamed. In fact, that's why he sent Jesus to the cross to die for all your sins. Number two, the second weapon of self-destruction, and you can just write down the last part, is uncontrolled thoughts. Whoever lays in bed at night and you can't stop your brain. If you don't learn how to control your thoughts, your thoughts will ruin your life. Who's ever let your, let your thoughts ruin your entire day or week or month? In fact, they found that the things that we think about the most are the things that we feel are uncontrollable in our lives. The third weapon of self-destruction is compulsions. Those are the, the inner desires, your lusts and habits and impulses, the things that in your life that you say, I, I, I knew it was wrong, but I just had to do it. The fourth weapon of self-destruction is fear. Fear is an enormous destroyer of happiness, of potential, and God's purpose for you. Fear will limit your life. The fifth weapon is hopelessness. And I'm just going through these quick because we're going to get into the answer. Hopelessness keeps us from keeping on. When you start to feel hopeless about anything, you get discouraged and you want to give up. Your, your marriage feels hopeless, you want to give up. Your finances feel hopeless, you want to give up. You feel hopeless about your health, you want to give up. I, I was a funeral chaplain for, for many years. I did over 3,500 funerals. And I was with many people on their deathbed. And I will tell you that many of them were told they had a shot at recovery, but they had lost all hope. Hopelessness is self-destructive. The sixth weapon of self-destruction is bitterness. Because life is unfair, and we don't all get the same thing, and life is broken, and we're, st we're st struck sometimes. Somebody hurts you. You can either get bitter, or you can get better, we know that. But you can never hurt anybody with your bitterness that you hurt yourself with. And number seven, the last one, the seventh weapon of self-destruction is insecurity. Insecurity will hold you back. It will cause pride to ruin your life. You'll say things that you shouldn't say. And, and here's the thing about insecurity and pride, the only, the only people impressed by fake people are fake people. Now, let's get to the Bible because Romans uh, gives, Romans 7 explains these seven things and then Romans 8 gives us the solution. So at the end of Romans 7, Paul says this, he's outlined the battle going on inside himself. He's, Paul's going through hell, but he's not pointing out the problems in anybody else. He's in a prison cell He's, he's, pointing, he's not pointing out anybody else that's a problem. Who spends a lot of your time pointing out everybody else that's a problem? Paul had every right to point out everybody in his life that was a problem. But he says this, he says, what a miserable person I am. I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm doing what I know I shouldn't be doing. He says, I've tried everything and nothing helps. He says, who will free me? from this life dominated by sin. Isn't that what all of us believers want today? Or we should, we want freedom from our own self-destructive ways. I do. Who, who will free me? Notice he doesn't say what will free me. Because the answer to your problem is inside you. The sins, the mess ups, the self-destruction, the answer is not a pill. The answer is not a program. The answer is not a politician. The answer is not a book. The answer is not a podcast or a seminar or hypnosis or crystals or chanting. No, the answer is a person and it's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer to everything going on inside of you and his Holy Spirit inside of you. Church, what good is saying we're a spirit-filled Christian if we're not a spirit-led Christian? Romans 8 is the answer to Romans 7. The spirit of God inside you wants to give you the antidote to the seven negative attributes. So what I want to look at this morning is how can I break free of me? How can I be set free from me? And in my opinion, Romans 8, greatest chapter in the Bible. About 90% of scholars say Romans 8 is the best one. So the first step in breaking free from me is this. Number one, write this down. I must remind myself every single day what Jesus did for me every day. That's a starting point. I've got to remind myself every day what Jesus did for me. We've got a lot of people who are saved, but they don't act like it. 
They run around filled with shame and uncontrolled thoughts and compulsions and fear and bitterness and insecurity. And, and they're believers, but they haven't broken free from themselves. I have to remind myself what Jesus did for me. And that's, that's the Holy Spirit has set me free from shame. Romans 8, 1 starts out, it says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. You're not condemned. That's good news. No condemnation means God doesn't judge you for all the things you've done wrong if you've trusted in Jesus because Jesus took all that judgment on the cross. He doesn't have to judge you because Jesus was judged. He doesn't have to condemn you because Jesus was condemned. He took your sentence. He paid your penalty. He did your time. The Bible says, if I'm a believer, I belong to Jesus, there's no condemnation. So my friends, I've got to remember every single day about Jesus and what he did for me. And every single day, I want to be more like Jesus. Every single morning, I wake up and I sit on the side of my bed and I drink 20 ounces of water. First thing I do every morning, I drink water. And while I'm drinking, chugging down that water, I say, Jesus, help me to be more like you today. Help me to be more like you today. Help me to be more like you today. And you know what? If I don't do anything else right today but be more like Jesus, my day will be a wonderful success. We're the Jesus people, amen? So every day I want to get up and I want to be like Jesus. Romans 8, 2 says, because you belong to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has given you life and has set you free from sin and death. So the Holy Spirit has given us the life of Jesus, so we ought to be wanting to be more in that life every day. As a Christian, when, when you became a Christian, before you were a Christian, all you had was willpower. How long does willpower last? Till you open the refrigerator. But it says now there's a new power in you that's greater than willpower. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians are still relying on willpower to change their life instead of God's power. You've got to connect to the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's God's power in me. I, I'm not a self-made man. I'm a God-made man. I, I'm not a, I, I don't have self-control. I've got God control in me. I, I can't do things on my own, church. Romans 8 says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. God's law can't save you. Keeping the law never works. Why? Because of our sinful nature. Laws simply work on the outside behavior. They don't work on the inside change. You know, you know the old joke, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I can put a dress on it. I can give it a bath. I can put perfume on it. I can tie a ribbon around its neck. And I can bring that pig outside and say, now, now what is it? It's still a pig. The outside is different, but it's the inside that matters, right? This is what happens when we try to get anything on the outside to fix what is inside. We try to get our money to fix our problems. We try to get politics to fix our problems. We try to pass a law, right? I'm just fixing up the outside. Only Jesus can change the inside. Only God can do that. God knew that laws couldn't save us. Romans 8, 3, uh, 3b to 4 says, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Number two, how do I break free from me? I ask the Holy Spirit to completely take over my mind. If you ask the Holy Spirit to give you better thoughts, do you think he will? Of course he will. That's a prayer he's going to answer. Last week, I was going through a rough time, and I had so many awful thoughts in my mind. We have been praying in our church. We've been in a, we don't have, this is a most incredible facility. We've been in this little tiny building and just crammed in there, and we've been praying for a new church building and praying for a new church building. Last summer, Pastor Robert was at our church, and he prophesied. He said, God's going to give you a building that is ready-made, you're just going to stick the key in the lock and open it and everything will be there and ready for you. He said, ready made church. And we thought, wow, that sounds wonderful. But our doubt was in there a little bit too. 
whoever gets you down in there a little bit. And we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and praying and struggling. We're looking at this building and this building and no and this building no and this one wouldn't let us in and this landlord didn't want a church and this development didn't want a church and this place didn't have the parking and this place the city didn't want a church because we don't produce any tax revenue for the city. And so every, nobody wanted a church where we are and we just kept praying and last, uh, last week we finally found a building. Oh, and, and it's, it's just the, it's the prime. We found this place and we're, we've been praying for it. It's this prime location. Most perfect location, I mean, right in the, in the middle of the middle of the middle of everything. And, oh, God, could it possibly be into you? And, and we, we came and uh, we got here last Monday and Pastor Robert said, well, of course God's going to give you that building, you know. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, praise the Lord, you know, I pray, we were believing. So I was laying in bed, you know, after he told I was laying in bed and, I, and I'm struggling in my mind and I'm struggling, oh, God, and what about this and what about this? And they, uh, they, uh, and they, wanted, they wanted a credit report and they're going to want finances and they're going to want profit and loss and they're going to want and we're a church and and we're a little bitty place and I'm struggling in my mind laying in the hotel room laying in my bed struggling struggling and all, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said to me who's in control of your thoughts Holy Spirit said is it you or is it me and I realized laying there I was the problem and I began to pray oh God I'm, I'm so sorry Holy Spirit take over my mind right now. Take over my thoughts right now. And such a peace settled over me. Our real estate agent reached out the next day and he's, oh, they're going to need all these things and all these things and they want to run all the credit for the church. Well, we're little, we don't really have any credit. Well, they're going to run your credit. Well, okay. I don't, I'm not a millionaire. They're going to run my credit. I'm a dollar heir. Who's a dollar heir? <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, great, go for it. And I'm praying, well, I filled out the whole credit application for this, this uh, you know, incredible building, big, beautiful space. And I filled out the whole thing and sent it off, clicked the button, and I said, okay, Holy Spirit, you've got my mind. And I clicked the button and let it go. Last night, we went to dinner, and it had been a few days. I hadn't heard anything, and I'm just letting it go. No, the Holy Spirit controls my mind. And suddenly, I got an email from our real estate agent. Now, our church doesn't even know this. In fact, they're all asleep right now. But the real estate agent sent over a note, and it said, the church has been completely approved. You got the building, and you get to move into your new church. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So our church doesn't know this yet, so don't tell them. Amen? Don't tell them. So if you ask the Holy Spirit to give you better thoughts, he will. Romans 8, 5 to 6, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. There are two kinds of mindsets. The mindset is your old nature or the mindset of the Holy Spirit. Which one do you think is going to bless your life more? Of course the Holy Spirit. So I have to choose between these mindsets. I, I don't just let the Holy Spirit have my mind at church and the flesh gets my mind at home or at work or out with my friends. It says letting the Spirit control your mind. You've got to give up control. The economy may not change. Every problem may not change, but your mindset can change. And that's just the difference between self-destruction and life and peace. Don't, don't pray, Holy Spirit, take the thought away. No, you replace it. Holy Spirit, give me new thoughts. Give me holy thoughts. Give me truthful thoughts. Give me noble thoughts. I've got some friends, and over the past few years, we all got healthier, and I lost 40 pounds. And my buddy Junior, he's Samoan. He lost 160 pounds. He's now a skinny Samoan. I don't know if you've ever seen one. <laughs> My buddy Josh lost 85 pounds. Adam, who was here with us this week, lost 100 pounds. My buddy Lance lost 110 pounds. And we've kept it off. So between us, we've lost over 500 pounds. And we go out together, and there's a gelato place we love. Who loves gelato? And they have all these amazing flavors. And they have two flavors that have no sugar added. And sometimes one of us is having a weak moment, and sometimes I want all the sugar added. And, and, and I'm standing there just staring at it. And you know what my buddies do? They say, Rowdy, they go, no, 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 no. You can have this over here. 
this is okay for you. Don't, you'll be happy you did. Don't eat that. Eat this. They divert my attention. See, you choose what you dwell on. The devil gives you ideas. That's called temptation. The Holy Spirit gives you ideas. That's called inspiration. And you can say, Holy Spirit, I invite you. You need to do this. I invite you to give me your ideas. And he does. I'd encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to have free access to your mind 24 hours a day. Number three way to break free from you is, this is really big, I realize I have a new ability to say no. Church, with the Holy Spirit in your life, you have a new power, and now you can say no to the things that you used to say yes to. In fact, practice it with me. I want to make, I want to make the wrong decision. What are you going to say? No. Is that amazing? Right? Right? Somebody wants to give you a million dollars, you say, yes. yes. <laughs> right? Somebody wants you to put a million dollars in the lottery, you say, no. You have God's power. Galatians 5, 16, let the spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the, the desires of the whole human nature. Does it say I won't have those desires? No, it says I won't satisfy those desires. People say, but, but if I feel this way, why shouldn't I do it? Because that's called maturity. Maturity is when you do the right thing not what you feel like doing. Because what you feel like doing isn't always God's best for you. You gotta realize you have an ability in Jesus Christ to say no. To say, look at the devil and say no. To look at people against you and say no. At somebody asking you to do things that are wrong for you and say no. This is the good news of Romans 8. Romans 8, 9 says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are, not controlled by, you are now controlled by the Holy Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And anybody who does not have the Spirit of God living in them does not belong to Jesus Christ. You have all of God living in you. The question is, do you, does God have all of you living in him? The more you give the more of, to him, the more of his power you're going to see at work in your life. Romans 8.12 says, So dear brothers... You have no obligation anymore to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. Who knows your sinful nature begs you? Come on. Whoever goes to the restaurant and you look at the menu and some of the bad things beg you. Right? Yes? I want to give you permission today to tell your flesh no in Jesus' name. In fact, when you go to do something this week, I want you to hear my voice say no. Don't do it. You don't have to. Amen? Number four, I need to turn my thoughts to God whenever I'm afraid. This is how God sets me free from self-destructing fear. Romans 8, 14 to 16. For the spirit God gives you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the spirit makes you God's children. And by the spirit's power, we cry out to God, Abba, Father. We cry out, Father. So what does God say to do when you're afraid? Stop focusing on your fear. We always go straight to focus on your faith, and that's good too. But stop focusing on your fear and start focusing on your Father. Because your Father is the one who will give you your faith. I always say, don't fake it till you make it. No, go to your Father so you don't have to fake it. Amen? This is how God sets me free. Hmm. The Bible says we should not be afraid. Instead, we turn to God and we trust him. And let me encourage you today, God is going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you, no matter what. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for the, spirit of God has, what, for the spirit that God has given us does not make us fearful or timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with power, love, and a sound mind. I went through COVID. Who remembers COVID? And I had, I, I had long COVID. It attacked my brain. I had dementia symptoms really badly. I couldn't remember people's names. I couldn't remember where we ate. I couldn't remember what I had for breakfast. If you'd have asked me right now, hey, hey, wasn't that a great breakfast this morning? I couldn't have told you what I had for breakfast. And this went on for, oh my goodness, almost three years and struggling and struggling. And finally in January, my wife said to me, 
you know, this is enough. You need to go to the doctor. And who knows that when your wife asks you to go to the doctor, men, what are you supposed to say? No. <laughs> what do we always say? No. You're supposed to say yes. Amen. If you want to save your marriage, when your wife asks you to do something, say yes. Men, practice that right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Say yes, honey. Yes, honey. Yes, honey. So finally, I, I said no over and over again. Finally, I went, went to the doctor because my mind was just absolutely a mess. And I was afraid. And I was afraid of whatever the doctor was going to say and what they were going to find. And I, I had, maybe it's early onset dementia, all these things going on. And I go to the doctor and they do all these tests and they sit us down and they've got a, they looked at my brain and I had, I had holes in my brain. If you've ever seen scans of my brain, there's one big hole right through the middle and there's indentations and other little holes. And it turns out those, those holes are not supposed to be there. And they said, we're going to start a whole treatment regimen and we've got vitamins and medicine and all these different things. And we went home and, and Ashley and I said, you know what, we're going to trust God, God's word, even over the doctor's word. Amen. And we began to pray and pray and trust God. And they said, we're all the medicine, they were, they were prescribing it and getting it ready for us and sending it all these things. And in one week's time, before they even sent the medicine, God supernaturally healed my brain, completely healed my mind. Amen? Amen? And, and, and now I just forget like most people forget. Amen? And, and so many, many people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. The truth is they should be afraid of not having the Holy Spirit. The more I have of the Holy Spirit, the more I have this, 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 this this, this mind control, I want that. The more love you have, I want that. The more courage you have, I want that. The fifth key to break free from me, number five, I need to focus on the long term, not the short term. God says, set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on eternity, heavenly things. As Christians, we, we, we win this hands down. Why? Because we have heaven to look forward to. Heaven is coming. We're not just thinking about life here on earth. And what about this? And what about the elections? And what about the laws? I'm just passing through. And no matter what happens, of course God is going to come through for us. Of course God is going to take care of us. Romans 8, 17 to 18 says, Since we are his children, we will possess the blessings he keeps for his people. We will possess them. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Oh, y'all, heaven is going to be so good. If we're focusing on the short term, everything's going to be bad. Our marriage is going to be bad, and our job is going to be bad, and our relationships are going to be... No, we're looking at the long term and eternity in heaven. If you're focusing on the, on the short term, there's a word for that. It's called control. Let it go. Amen? And that leads us to number six. I need to remind myself that God is good and God is in control. The world gets to speak lies to you about 10,000 minutes a week. Your pastor gets to speak the truth to you about 30 minutes a week. And so while you're here, you need to be reminded that God is good and God is in control. I don't have time to go into all this, but Paul says in verses 19 to 25, it says sin has damaged the world. It's bad. He says, all creation groans with pain like childbirth. We groan inside. Life is tough. The world is tough. Bad things happen. And what happens? We get bitter and life isn't fair and we get bitter and my spouse is difficult and we get bitter. My friends, life is unfair because it's broken. You're going to have pain and suffering. But Paul says this, Romans 8, 26, in the same way the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God, watch this, who sees into our hearts, knows what the thought of the Spirit is because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people in accordance with his will. The Holy Spirit is praying for you. You. 
The Holy Spirit is praying for, you might write that down. God's good will will always be done in my life. And this helps me overcome bitterness, right? Because I can remember, number one, no matter how bad it gets, God is on my side. Number two, God's using everything in my life for good. Number three, God wants me to succeed. God doesn't want me to fail. God's for me, Romans 8, 31. And number four, God will give me what I need. Friends, if, if God loved, loved us enough to let Jesus die on the cross for you, don't you think he loves you enough to take care of everything in your life? Of course he will. There's nothing in your life God doesn't care about. In fact, write this down. It will all turn out good in the end. If it's not good, it's not the end. Let me wrap this up. Take this home, put it up on the bathroom mirror, the refrigerator, the visor in your car. How do I destroy insecurity in my life? If you're insecure, you're a people pleaser, you fear rejection. Number seven, I need to trust that God loves me completely and he will never stop loving me. God cannot not love his family. He will never stop loving you completely, passionately, freely. Romans 8, 38, read it later, but nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, nothing. I may lose a lot of things in life, but I'll never lose the love of God or my value in Jesus Christ. You can't lose it. Once you're in God's hand, he says, I'm not letting you go. You might let go of his hand, but he says he won't let go of yours. And this has the power to erase all of your insecurities. You don't need to prove anything to anybody. You don't have to earn anything, be good enough, good looking enough, have enough money. God loved you completely before you even came out of the womb of your mother, before he even created you in your mother's womb. This is how you break free from you and give all your life to God so that you can become everything he created you to be. And so let's pray today, and this is really where it happens for me. Let's pull all this together for your life and future. So bow your heads with me, will you? This is the most important part today. I'm going to pray a prayer as we close, and I'm going to ask you to pray it. And as I pray, you can say, yeah, God, me too. That's me. That's me. So say this in your heart, dear Jesus, thank you for all that you did for me. Thank you that there's no condemnation in my life for all the sins that I've done. You took that condemnation. Come on, you got to believe in this. You're the Jesus people. If we don't believe it, we're in trouble. Thank you, Jesus, that you did what the law couldn't do. Thank you that you destroyed sin's control. Thank you that you accomplished the law in my life. My righteousness is nothing, but your righteousness is the ticket I get into heaven. Help me to never forget what you did for me. When I feel ashamed, let me remember what you did on the cross for me. Holy Spirit, I ask you to take control of my mind. There are things I've been worried about and obsessing about, and that's wrong because I'm a child of God. So I ask you to give me better thoughts. I want to switch mindsets. I don't want the mindset of self-destruction. I want the mindset of the Holy Spirit, which is life and peace. So take control. Remember, it says the, life, the, the mind controlled by the Holy Spirit. Control my mind, Holy Spirit. I don't want to think my old ways. I want to think your new ways. I invite you to put thoughts in my mind all the time because those are the truth. And Father, keep praying. Help me to remember and realize that I have a new ability to say no. Lord, I just used to have willpower, but now I've got your power. I'm not obligated to give into those compulsions anymore. If I ask you for help, you'll help me and give me the strength to say no. Thank you that no temptation is too strong. And when I'm afraid, for those of you dealing with fear, help me to turn my thoughts to you. Help me to remember I'm your child and help me to cry out, Father, Abba, I'm afraid. Admit it to God. Help me to focus on my father and not on my fears. Help me to focus on the long term, not the short term. You know the pain in my life, God. You know the suffering. And I want you to use it for good and I want you to use it for your glory. And God, I want to look and focus on eternity, not just here and now. I want to do the right thing, not the easy thing. 
And when I start to get bitter and I feel life is unfair and when I feel hurt, help me to remember that you, God, are good and you love me and you're in control, that the Holy Spirit is praying for me. Thank you for doing that. You're working all things together for good. Pray that out loud. God, you are working all things together for good. Thank you for doing that. Thank you that you're for me and not against me. Thank you for that. And that you didn't spare Jesus so you'll give us whatever we need. And most of all, Father, I thank you that you will never let go of me and you'll never stop loving me. Other people might let go. Other people might stop loving me, but you'll never reject me. Thank you that I cannot lose your love no matter what else I lose on this earth, that you will never stop loving me. And today, if you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart, say right now, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want you to be the manager of my life. I don't understand all this, but I want to trust in you completely. I don't want to go the world's way anymore. I want to go your way toward life and peace. Forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for your grace to me. I want to love you for the rest of my life and all eternity, and I ask you accept me into your family by faith. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you pray there right now, just take one minute and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.